I'd like to talk to you uh, about uh, the history that humans have got with trying to talk with technology. Uh, through doing this, um, I'm going to play a, a bunch of video clips and audio clips. Some of them are pretty old and the sound is pretty poor, so if for that reason or any other you're having trouble understanding some of the speech content in them, um, you can head over to the URL on screen and find some text transcripts of all the video content. So I'm going to kick off with actually uh, some pretty well-known words from a very familiar voice. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. Stephen Hawking, of course, on the uh, Pink Floyd album, The Division Bell, from the early 90s. And it's a wonderful piece of uh, text because it's very, very true. For a long time, humans didn't talk. We communicated in many different ways. But it was speech and our ability to talk to each other that gave us some of our most creative moments, enabled us to progress to, well, here we are today in the heart of Silicon Valley with all the extraordinary things we're able to accomplish and continue to accomplish with technology. It might be argued, perhaps, that as humans, we need to learn to talk to each other a little better. Uh, still too much happens in the world that could well be resolved or avoided if we learn to talk to each other a little more. But despite that, we're entering into a new era now where we're starting to talk more and more often, not with each other, but with our technology. And talking to technology actually uh, goes back a lot further than you might think. People have been trying to recreate human speech for a really long time. Rumor has it that Pope Sylvester II, back in about 1003 or so, uh, tried to create devices that would mimic human speech by effectively uh, mimicking what we knew about uh, anatomy, lungs, and, and, and vocal tracts, and all the rest of it. In uh, the late 1700s, uh, a Danish-German scientist known as Krasenstein did that. He created uh, uh, effectively a set of lungs, uh, vocal cords, and uh, drew air backwards and forwards over the vocal cords to mimic speech. Sadly, from back that far, we don't have time, uh, sorry, there was too much time ago for there to be recordings. But we do have recordings from much earlier in the last century. And at the World's Fair, there was a piece of technology called the Voda. And it was similarly uh, an anatomical representation that uh, mimicked the way human speech is made through uh, drawing air backwards and forwards over the vocal cords. The machine uses only two sounds produced electrically. One of these represents the breath. The other, the vibration of the vocal cords. There are no phonograph records or anything of that sort. Only electrical circuits, such as are used in telephone practice. Let's see how you put expression into a sentence. Say, she saw me with no expression. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. And it's really quite incredible considering how far back in time that was in, in relative terms and how much uh, emphasis and accent there is in the speech that, that gave meaning to those three different sentences. Things that actually in a lot of respects and a lot of circumstances we still struggle with today. If we roll forward a few years to the early 1960s, at the Bell Laboratories, uh, they came up with the first well-known uh, electronic synthetic speech, so moving away from mechanical into uh, electronic synthetic speech. And with computing power that probably took up the size of a small airport terminal, we naturally did the first thing we could think of. We made it sing. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer. I'm and in doing so, of course, we gave every science fiction film from 2001 onwards uh, its song of the moment for any devious and nefarious artificial intelligence out there. 
If we roll forward again to the 1970s, we started to see technology for children in toys uh, starting to talk to uh, our kids. And in doing so, we probably drove the first generation of parents absolutely up the wall with having to listen to this all the time. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. I had one of these things. It surprises me still that my parents are actually talking to me. But the, the sound quality is incredible. It's very, very artificial. But it's actually remarkably clear. If we look at another example, though, of broadly the same time and a toy robot, uh, despite the poor sound quality of this video clip, we get a very different vocal experience. Thank you for turning me on. Let me introduce myself. I am 2XL, the smartest toy robot in the world. And actually, very realistic human sounding speech, quite simply because that's what it is. This is a recording, uh, and it was embedded inside the toy and, of course, was limited to very few phrases. But the difference between entirely synthetic speech and synthetic speech that in some way, shape, or form uses real human uh, speech patterns is, is still something we see in current speech technologies today. By the time we get to 1984, the early 80s, we saw the first of the technologies that could take a piece of text and translate it into synthetic speech. I am Perfect Paul, the standard male voice. I am Beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. Some people think I sound a bit like a man. <laughs> and there's probably something to be said for that. These uh, synthetic voices were not particularly good in terms of their kind of uh, quality or characteristics, but they did enable the technology that became the underpinning thing that people who use screen readers, people who are blind, uh, depend on. It takes text and translates it into speech. Apple uh, also made inroads into the synthetic speech uh, arena uh, in the 1984 uh, Macintosh launch. Now, we've done a lot of talking about Macintosh recently, but today, for the first time ever, I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. And accustomed as I am to public speaking, I'd like to share with you a match and I thought of the first time I made an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer you can't win. And there we get two themes that are still very common in technologies today. Humor as a means of creating a, a, a more natural sounding relationship or a more, more natural sounding conversation and also talking technology that takes an affectionate, if light-hearted, poke at the competition. Apple, again, came through with uh, voice recognition in one of its products in the 90s. Macintosh, open letter. Macintosh, print letter. Macintosh, fax letter. While everyone else is still trying to build a computer you can understand, Macintosh, shut down. We've built a Macintosh that can understand you. Goodbye. By my reckoning, it took another 15 years before we really got to a point where technology understood, well, me at least anyway, but this was another important thing. It was one of the first times that people could talk to technology as opposed to having it talk to them. So we started to see the other half of the conversation emerging and it to start to look very much like a dialogue instead of a one-way flow of communication. In 97, we got something called Dragon Naturally Speaking, a software known as speech recognition designed mostly for use by lawyers and uh, people doing post-mortems and other things where needing to dictate reports uh, was a, an extremely useful thing to be able to do. Uh, it's actually software now that is used a lot by people with disabilities who, for whatever reason, are not able to interact with their technology in the conventional way of mouse or keyboard or other physical input device. And it also introduced a slightly peculiar way of talking to get the correct grammar and syntax and punctuation in the dictated text. This is Dragon Naturally Speaking, comma. Speech recognition software that turns your voice into text three times faster than typing. 
with up to 99% accuracy, period. Something that sounds really awkward when you first start doing it, but I use voice a lot to dictate text messages and other things because I'm too lazy to, to touch type on my iPhone or other touch devices. Uh, and you very easily find yourself falling into these patterns where you're, you're actually speaking your punctuation as you go. And before long, it oddly feels quite natural. Uh, Apple uh, came again with uh, Siri in 2011. And this, I think, was probably one of the first instances where technology conversations really did feel well, conversational. Siri, where can I find something to eat? There are 25 Chinese restaurants located on Spadina. I don't want Chinese food. Sorry, I thought that was all you ate, Mad Chin. Fine. Where's the closest one? Uh, with Microsoft, we saw Cortana come to its various devices uh, and uh, be a useful digital assistance, uh, particularly in Windows 10 on the desktop. And it enabled us to start offloading some of those kind of boring or, or commonplace tasks uh, onto the digital assistants. Hey, Cortana. Guess what? There are 2,335,981,212,665 possible answers to that question. And again, we see humor being used as a way to naturalize and, and make a conversation with technology familiar. Amazon Echo in 2014 came along, and this was uh, one of the devices that made another shift in the way we conversed and interacted with technology. We didn't need to pick up a device or even really be necessarily very near it. It was something that could sit on a surface in our house somewhere and we could just converse with it. Alexa, what is the forecast for Seattle, Washington? Right now in Seattle, Washington, it's 44 degrees with showers. Tonight's forecast has rainy weather with a low of 39 degrees. Alexa, set a timer for five seconds. Five seconds, starting now. And it was really useful because you can interact with this no matter what else you're doing. You might be cooking, running around after the kids, just you know, doing any other activity you might be in your house. And yet we now have a technology that we can have a conversation with and get it to do some pretty useful stuff. Google introduced another piece of the puzzle, uh, and this time it was context awareness. Humans, when they talk to each other, often use the context to change the way the conversation goes or the language that they choose to use. And Google introducing this in their home assistant uh, enabled that to be translated into conversations with technology. So you want to see it in action? Yes? All right, let's do it. So here he's listening to Skrillex. And you wonder, like me, what is his real name? OK, Google. What's his real name? Skrillex's full name is Sonny John Moore. Who knew? And so now we've got another ability to talk more naturally with technology. We don't necessarily need to ask a specific question. We can just ask the technology to bear in mind the context of the conversation and to make some logical deductions about the next question that we're going to ask it and get the results, more often than not, uh, that we were hoping for. So altogether, speech is really powerful. When, when humans use speech, we do it for all sorts of reasons. We can amuse each other, we can comfort each other, scare each other, uh, we can you know, instill a whole amount of uh, emotions and reactions just through the words we use and the way that we use them but speech is pretty strange. Uh, we use idioms, we use slang, and as I said, context is important. Uh, in the UK, if you live in the north of the country, a term of affection for anybody you might interact with is pet. That's obviously also the same word that we use for the furry creatures that we often cohabit with in the form of cats and dogs and hamsters and all sorts of other bits and pieces. To anyone who doesn't know which version is being used, a stranger coming up to you on the street and saying, all right, pet, <clears throat> might cause a bit of consternation. But language is strange. It is like that. Uh, if we are in a coffee shop, for example, we might walk in and say, you know, I'll take a, a, an Americano to go. The context makes the language that we've chosen and the words that we've chosen more meaningful. Speech isn't even needed a lot of the time. I get this all the time as a blind person. I'll ask someone where something is, and I'll, over there. OK, uh, and you'll ask me again, and uh, that way. <laughs> OK, that's great. 
um, we, we shrug. You know, uh, if someone says, you know, do, do you know the answer to something? No, not really, maybe. So quite often when humans communicate, we don't need speech at all. We need some kind of visual representation to help the conversation move along. So when it comes to conversations with technology, we've got to do several things to make that conversation seem as natural as possible. The speech itself has got to sound reasonably natural. Uh, it's got to be intelligible. We've got to be able to understand the words as they're spoken. And the actual words themselves have to be understandable. But that's collectively a fairly complex challenge. When it comes to actually creating the voices themselves, uh, a number of technologies have emerged over the years. Uh, we have formant synthesis, which was entirely artificial. So the voice that was produced uh, did not use any real human speech at all. It was entirely artificial. As a result, the sound quality is incredibly robotic. To anyone not familiar listening to these voices, they're really hard to understand, but they're incredibly responsive. So if we listen to a quick example. Mankind lived just like the animals, then something happened and unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. So yeah, very robotic, but as I said, very responsive. And if you happen to use, say, a screen reader that depends on these technologies and you're moving fast around your computer, you really want that responsiveness, which is why you will often find that people like me who use screen readers will stick to these kind of old school voices, not because the sound quality is particularly good, but because they let us move at speed. And speed goes a little bit like this. So that's the kind of speed that I tend to listen to stuff if I'm just browsing my email or, or looking at stuff on the web. So responsive in these things is really important, at least for one particular chunk of the audience. We then started to use concatenative synthesis, which took small chunks of real human speech. And when uh, synthetic speech was created, it took all these chunks and formed them up into words and sentences and paragraphs. So the sound quality improved quite noticeably, or the speech quality. But we did, in trade-off, just lose a little bit of the responsiveness. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened that unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. So the kind of flow of the conversation is a lot better. The pause for the, the commas and the full stops or the periods is, is a lot more natural. And the speech quality sounds you know, remarkably more natural than the formant synthesis versions. Now we are looking at a time where we're using parametric synthesis more and more. So again, we're back to completely artificial speech, but one that holds a lot of information about prosody, uh, the characteristics of speech, about the vocal tract, the vocal source, all as parameters of algorithms that can be used to create entirely synthetic speech. And so with all this capability and computing power, of course, what did we do? We made it sing. And I'm going to be singing that for days every time I hear that. But if you didn't know that was synthetic speech, uh, I think most people would be hard pressed to actually tell that it wasn't a real person singing there. So the quality now is incredible and the responsiveness and the, the capability of these voices is pretty extraordinary. And uh, Google uh, and its DeepMind team were one of the most instrumental kind of groups behind this technology. Uh, and parametric synthesis, if you use a Google device that speaks to you, uh, is now what underpins almost all of, of those conversational uh, interfaces uh, in terms of the speech that you actually hear. So how do we do it under the hood? Well, we've got uh, voice XML is one language. It dates back a few years now to 99. Uh, this lets you define the chunks of a conversation, so the, the, the things that one thing is going to say, the pauses, uh, and other bits and pieces like that. If you've ever been on the telephone and you've been there cursing the automated phone system that you're trying desperately to get your way through to speak to a real person, this is the technology that underpins it. It's the bit that, that, that holds the whole conversation together, decides what those menu items are going to be, what the conversational chunks are going to be that you have to listen to. We have uh, speech synthesis markup language, uh, another spec uh, that goes back a few years. Uh, this is the spec, for example, that uh, underpins a lot of the speech technology in the Amazon Echo. And it lets us define the characteristics of speech, the speed, the pitch, the cadence, the volume, uh, a number of other characteristics that start to add some of the humanity into speech capability. 
On the web, we've got some interesting uh, possibilities too. Uh, there's something called the CSS speech module, which has actually been floating around for many years uh, under different names. Uh, it's uh, a way to uh, design the audio interface or the oral interface to uh, what's on the web in the same way that we more conventionally recognize CSS as designing the graphical or the visual interface. And it has a whole bunch of properties that let you do things a bit like speech synthesis markup. Uh, you can design the volume or the speed or the pitch uh, and a whole number of other characteristics. But this time, the intention is, is that you would apply it to your web content. So uh, in theory, if it were supported by browsers and screen readers, someone like me could get a whole interesting audio experience when listening to content. Uh, it's not particularly well supported, sadly, which is why it's never become an official recommendation. Uh, WebKit has some support for it, and on iOS, it's, uh, it's reasonably well supported. But other than that, unfortunately, uh, it hasn't really gained kind of some traction, which I think is a real shame, because if you think back to the quality of the formant synthesis voice I showed you earlier, uh, listening to content when you're a screen reader user can be really boring. Everything just sounds like that, so a little bit of uh, interest wouldn't go amiss. The counter argument, of course, is what happens if someone takes control of that and has their entire website shouting at you at full volume? And there's a fair argument in that. But I figure, you know, you cited people have to look at things that are just really ghastly designs and God knows what color. So a little bit of equality, I guess, and, <laughs> and really bad audio designs, you know, maybe there's some fairness in that. We also have uh, uh, another technology, the Web Speech API. Uh, this is uh, something that lets you uh, use speech synthesis uh, to enable your web applications to talk to you and also speech recognition so you can talk back to it so we can use uh, this particular uh, specification to design technologies within web platform uh, web application interfaces uh, you can actually use the uh, the web speech uh, technology to uh, do a proof of concept, if you like, of what the CSS speech module might uh, sound like if you happen to use a screen reader. This sounds normal. This sounds loud. This sounds quiet. This sounds fast. This sounds slow. This sounds high. This sounds low. So you could do interesting things, I figure, with, you know, uh, maybe the, you know, the copyright and other bits of information in the footer of a web page. You could just have it spoken in that kind of super fast voice, a bit like you hear, you know, the terms and conditions on, on radio adverts and things like that. Or, you know, headlines on a news site could maybe just be uh, uh, elevated in volume just a little bit just to, to kind of give you the audio equivalent of the visual kind of boldness of the text or, or the size of the font. So when it comes to the actual conversation, what can we actually do about the, the conversation itself, the, 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 the interface, if you like, that brings the synthetic speech and the technology that designs the conversation together with probably the most important bit, the human on the other side of the conversation? There's a set of design principles called the inclusive design principles. Uh, they're just very, very simple principles uh, designed to help people make products that are inclusive. Uh, and by inclusive, uh, it means Someone who has a permanent disability, someone like me who's blind, or someone who uh, has a physical disability, for example, that may mean they can't use technology in the conventional ways. Someone who has a, a temporary disability, someone who's broken their arm, has really bad RSI, or for whatever other reason, for a short period of time, is not able to interact with technology in the conventional ways. And also situational disability. People who are in noisy environments and can't hear audio properly, people out in the bright sunshine who can't see the screen properly. There's a whole bunch of reasons where actually uh, the situation we're in means that we benefit from more inclusive design. So the first principle is uh, provide a comparable experience, which is an interesting idea when you get down to an interface that's designed around one theme, talking. But actually, it turns out that there are things we can do. A lot of the devices that we talk with have second screens or uh, first screens that act as an alternative to the conversation. So one thing we can really simply do is when we design conversational interfaces, provide a text alternative if you can. So uh, I have an Echo at home, and uh, you know, I know that I can go in and, and look at the app and see my conversation with it uh, displayed in the app or on the website if I chose to log in. So someone who, for whatever reason, isn't able to uh, hear the speech of a conversational UI can actually just go and have a look at a text alternative. So even though it sounds a little bit strange, text alternatives to conversational uh, interfaces still do have their uses. Consider the situation. Uh, people use conversational interfaces in all kinds of situations. 
you might be just quietly sitting at home uh, in, in a, a fairly you know, chilled out environment. Uh, you might be driving your car. Uh, you, you might be chasing the kids around the house. You might be cooking, as I said earlier. There's a whole bunch of reasons uh, or places and environments in which we might be talking with technology. So keeping the interface simple and giving people a, a good cue to kind of get through the conversation is incredibly important. So you don't want to do something like this. Uh, if I say to my conversational app, uh, open Learn About Tequila. Yeah. Ooh, cut off. But if it just says opening Learn About Tequila, that doesn't really give me anywhere to go. It doesn't give me any guidance as to what I can take the conversation to next. It doesn't really tell me anything about what this app is going to do. So it kind of just leaves me a bit stuck. And, and now I've got to flounder around and, and, and ask it what's going on. If instead we say, uh, open, learn about tequila. You can learn about Joven, Blanco, or Rico Cedo tequila. Which one do you want? I would like to learn about Joven tequila, I think, today. But it gives me a really good conversational cue, something that humans do all the time. We, we guide each other through conversations. It's why if you've ever spoken to someone who just answers you with one single word, conversations sometimes get a bit difficult. As humans, what we often try to do is steer each other through the conversation, and it's a back and forth. We give each other cues and other things to work off of. Be consistent. Uh, use familiar words and phrases, uh, particularly things that are familiar in, in conversation. A lot of conversational interview, uh, interfaces uh, have a sort of formality to them that often makes them quite awkward to, to actually experience. So the more we can get a sense of the informality and the familiarity of language, uh, the better off we will be. So don't ask your users to say something like, uh, initiate flight status. Ask about ZZ, flight ZZ 1030, and then get something like this in reply. 1050 is delayed due to system fault X32G reposted time of departure is 15.30 hours. I'm probably going to miss that flight. I don't know what that just said. But don't make people work too hard. Instead, do things like this. Uh, ask flight status about my flight from Bristol to Amsterdam. Your flight from Bristol to Amsterdam is delayed due to a mechanical fault. It will now depart at 3.30 p.m. Much better. Familiar language, informal language that's completely understandable to me as a human being. So job well done. Give people control. Uh, people should be able to access information in the way they want to. Uh, so giving them the right kind of choices and again, guiding them through the conversation is really useful. So don't do things like overwhelm them with information. Um, ask the tea shop, what's the most popular tea? Here are the most popular teas. One English breakfast, two Darjeeling, three Assam, four Earl Grey. Excellent. What was number one again? I, don't overwhelm people with information. People don't like being asked to work harder than we need to. Um, we're kind of lazy, and, and that's okay. That's a good thing. So our technology needs to kind of appreciate that. So we need to make things easier. So ask the tea shop, what are the most popular teas? The most popular tea is English breakfast. Would you like to hear more? Yes, please. Okay. Two Darjeeling, three Assam, four Earl Grey. Excellent. So information in manageable chunks. I'm kind of in control of the conversation, and I decided I wanted to take it a bit further and hear some more information when I was given that opportunity. Offer choice. Uh, choice is really important. You want to do it in the right way. So offering small amounts of choices and, and feeding uh, you know, the option of additional information is really, really useful. Also, presenting the choices in the right way. If I ask the burger shop to order me a milkshake, mm. You can order chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, banana, or peanut butter. For chocolate, say chocolate. For strawberry, say strawberry. For vanilla, say vanilla. For banana, say banana. Or for peanut butter, say peanut butter. So there is such a thing as being too helpful <laughs> and providing too much information. But instead, if I say, uh, burger shop, uh, I want to order a milkshake. Mm. Would you like chocolate, strawberry, or another flavor? Uh, another flavor. There is also vanilla, banana, or peanut butter. No. Which would you like? Uh, today, I think peanut butter, maybe. But again, that whole conversation was a lot easier because I wasn't overwhelmed with information. Uh, it wasn't trying to be too helpful and confuse me in the process. It was just a nice, simple vocal interaction. Helping people prioritize. Um, 
visually, if you scan down a list of options that you've got on a website or something, um, it's pretty easy to kind of scan the list in, in, in various ways, pick the option that you want, and decide to go for it. A conversational interface doesn't work that way because you're relying on memory a lot more. So uh, don't want to do things that go like this. Um, open the recipe book app. Delete a recipe, edit a recipe, find a recipe, or choose an ingredient. Which one do you want? Oh, I don't know. Uh, listing all the possibilities that an app can possibly do isn't really helpful. It's not really how conversations work. But if we can design the conversation to suggest the most likely activity somebody's going to do, uh, that makes things a lot easier. So uh, open my recipe book. Do you want to find a recipe or something else? Um, I'm probably going to go ahead and find a recipe because that's probably the most likely activity I want to do in this particular app. Lastly, we want to add value. Uh, how do we add value and just lift the interaction up so that the experience is just really enjoyable or at least satisfactory, uh, depending on, on the nature of the interaction itself? And we can do that in this context by remembering that when we are creating these interfaces, which we invariably do by typing and writing, that we're actually writing a conversation that's going to be heard for the most part, not seen or read on text. So uh, we have to sort of bear that in mind. Uh, if I ask scorekeeper about the uh, status of the Bristol game. The 20 Harlequins. Time remaining 0, 0, 30, 30. So certainly in the UK, I don't know if it's the same here in the US, but that's a very familiar way of writing out the score of, uh, in this case, a rugby match. Uh, you put the, the results sort of back to back in the middle of the names of the two teams, uh, and, and you know, time might be written in, in a fairly good visual format, but it doesn't really translate into uh, the conversational context. So if I ask the same question, uh, scorekeeper, tell me about the Bristol game. With 35 minutes to go, the score is Bristol 35, Harlequins 20. And in case you're worrying, the right team is winning that particular match. So. But we have some big conversational questions to ask as well. So if we, we bring all these technologies together, we design these interfaces, there is a whole bunch of stuff that we need to think about. We need to think about the privacy of conversational interfaces. The privacy in sense of, of our conversation, but also just privacy in, in the most practical sense. If you happen to be the captain of a starship somewhere, and you're the only person on the bridge talking to your technology, that's absolutely fine. If you work in an open plan office where there's 300 of you all talking to your technology, stuff's going to get really complicated really quickly. So we need to understand how and where can we have these conversational interfaces in a practical sense. When you are having a conversation with technology, how can we make sure that what you're saying to it uh, you know, can't be overheard or is, is protected in some way just from you know, environmental privacy considerations? We need to think about security. We have uh, a slight tendency, because it's conversational perhaps, to be a little bit more open with our technology than we might otherwise be. You know, we will ask it questions, uh, we'll have conversations with it, and in the course of doing that, we might share more information. So we need to make sure that data is exchanged between the device and uh, any services in the cloud or wherever that, that need to uh, be used to make the conversation happen. We need to make sure that there is security at that level. We need to make sure that uh, if data is stored for any reasons, it's protected and secured at that level. We also just need to make sure that we protect the security of the way we talk to these devices as well. And then we have to think about things like identity. How do we identify ourselves as part of a conversational interface? Again, going back to a Star Trek reference, you know, it used to be there that they thought you could uh, enable self-destruct on a starship just by saying your name and an alphanumeric sequence. We now know that it's incredibly easy to fake that. We can fake people's voices. We can, we can hack those short codes. But silliness apart, how do we actually do that? Is there going to come a time, I think almost certainly, where we're going to need to identify ourselves in order to uh, you know, make secure transactions, to, to, to have certain kinds of interaction? We're going to need to be able to identify ourselves conversationally. And so we've got to think about how we can manage that in a way that makes sense and is robust and secure. And lastly, and possibly the most important, we have to think about trust. Trust in the sense, of course, of privacy and security and identity, but actually trust in a far more fundamental human way. When I was putting together this talk, I read an article, and it came up with this incredible uh, scenario. Imagine if you bought your child a teddy bear, and it was a talking teddy bear that uses 
all of our current capabilities in terms of conversational interfaces. And your child makes friends with the teddy bear. But about six months after you've bought it, the teddy bear suddenly, <gasps> I miss my best friend. You should tell mommy and daddy. You should tell your big sister. You should tell whoever that for your next birthday, I'd really like my best friend to come and live with us. And best friend turns out to be a teddy bear that costs another $300. And if pester power of the average two-year-old is anything to go by, uh, all hell is about to grow, <laughs> break loose on that one. But talking to technology, as I said earlier, it does mean we're a little bit more inclined to trust. We're a little bit more inclined to invest some of our humanity into these interactions. We're actually a lot more inclined to impose some of our humanity or to project some of our humanity onto the technology that we're conversing with. So we've got some really important questions there to ask about how we create these conversational interfaces, what we do with them, where we put them, and the bridges that it enables the technology to build with us as humans and the consequences of what happens when they do. So I hope that's been an interesting history on our attempts to talk with technology, some of the technologies that underpin our efforts, and some of the ways we can make conversational interfaces much more usable for at least the human half of the conversation. But I'm going to leave you again with those words from Stephen Hawking, not least because I think it's important that as people, we keep talking to each other more than ever, it seems, in the world now. But as we kind of embark on this new adventure talking with technology, uh, I think we've got some incredibly exciting times ahead of us and I'm really looking forward to it. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. And so now I think we can unleash the power of our imagination to go and talk more with technology. Thank you.